Hello and welcome to Bread and Thread, a podcast about food and domestic history. I'm Liz. And I'm Hazel. We are two friends who studied archaeology together and love history and also making and baking things. So what have you been up to, Liz? I bought a crochet pattern for a horseshoe crab. (laughs) It's life size. What? Oh, hold on. Life size to a horseshoe crab. Yeah. Okay. How big is a horseshoe crab? Like 50 centimeters across. Okay. That's okay. For some reason, when you said life size, I thought human life size. (laughs) You have a very limited definition of life. (laughs) I don't know. Just. I, mean, I have visions of this. I would absolutely adore a six foot horseshoe crab toy. <laughs> Who wouldn't want a gigantic knitted horseshoe crab that they can curl up to sleep on? I mean, I have been getting very into kaiju. What? What is that? Like Godzilla type <gasps> giant monsters. Oh, okay. Cool. I didn't know there was a name for them. Yeah, I think it just means like strange creature, but like literally Aww. just means strange creature, but in practice it means Godzilla, etc. Okay, cool. So what what have you been making? Um, I've been rendering down some of the beeswax from our bees so that I can make candles. Nice. Yeah, so I've kind of figured out how to actually do it without everything going everywhere and having a very waxy kitchen, which is great. <laughs> Does that mean you're going to have spooky beeswax candles for Halloween? Oh, maybe. I don't know. I'm going to try uh, colouring them with food colouring, I think. So that will be I fun. I have seen things saying very much do not do that. Oh, why? Um, apparently, I mean, there's different kinds of food colouring, obviously, but apparently a thing can happen where it all gathers at the bottom. Okay. And then the food colouring just catches fire. Oh no. <laughs> okay, maybe I'll do some research as to the best thing to colour candles with. Like, I don't know what the best thing is, but apparently it isn't food colouring. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, I stand corrected. Maybe I'll do not that. <laughs> but speaking of Halloween... This episode will be going up, I believe, on the 28th of October. Oh yeah, it's spooky time, friends. We said we were going to do Ursats next, but this is our closest release to Halloween. So Hazel... We we can't miss it. We can't not do a Halloween episode. So Hazel, what spooky thing have you been researching? So, uh, I am going to talk about some pumpkin carving facts. The history of pumpkin carving. Excellent. And also a little bit about um, All Souls Day and (coughs) traditions to do with that, because that's kind of a lesser known one these days, and I thought it would be interesting. Even though it's what Halloween is named after. Yeah. Um, So on that note, um, apparently Halloween was first proclaimed as a Christian festival in the year 998, which I guess I've never really thought that much about the origins of Halloween as a Christian festival, but that's quite a long time ago. I'm just trying to work out why that year sounds familiar. (laughs) (laughs) I know, it kind of sounds like 1998, which, you know, stuff happened then. (laughs) Um, So, yeah, that's quite a long time ago. and. as a, I mean, this is fairly well known stuff, but um, um, so the night before All Souls Day or Old Saints Day, um, which is about honouring martyrs and saints in America and Britain, particularly, is because it's quite a Catholic festival. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think the reason 
it's not such a popular festival um, in America and Britain, um, at least today, is because it's more kind of a Catholic festival. And so I think it is still celebrated in other areas of the world. Like I think you mentioned Ireland earlier. Yeah, I've, I've heard of it being celebrated in Ireland. Um, yeah, so there's a few kind of traditional things related to that, which um, although it would declined as a Catholic holiday uh, in the UK, there were still a lot of traditions and folklore re- related to it that continued um, and some of, some of them still continue. So I thought that would be a fun thing to talk about. Um, I am excited for this spookiest of episodes. Oh, ho, ho. <laughs> so as as is uh, fairly well known, Halloween it conveniently corresponds with the Celtic festival of I believe it's pronounced Samhain. Uh, Samhain, I think. Samhain. Okay, um, which was apparently the end of summer um so the the end of like the fruitfulness of summer and going into that transitional time between autumn and winter which was also apparently known as a time like a liminal time so Mm. i think that's where the whole thing about uh, you know the the veil is thin (laughs) um (laughs) that kind of thing like like spirits of the dead were thought to be closer than at other times of the year and i yeah, think it's something to do with the year coming to an end as well yeah because um dia de los muertos um in south america i think also comes from all souls okay it's kind of um a syncretism of all souls and indigenous tradition oh cool um, yeah, I think there are many similar traditions around the world um, that are to do with these kind of transitional times um, and times when the spirits of the dead are believed to be uh, closer than at other times of the year. So a lot of the information or the things that I'm going to talk about today came from a book called Festivals, Family and Food, which is fantastic, especially if you've got kids. But um, even if you haven't, it's really interesting. It has a lot of old traditions in it. Um, It kind of focuses on the Christian festivals, but it also has a lot of information about older traditions and where they came from um, and a lot of folklore in it. So it it is a really cool book. Um, and so the tradition of carving pumpkins is a really, really old one, actually, or the tradition of carving things, because the original things that were carved were turnips, neeps in Scotland, which are not turnips, as I found out today. No, the Swedes. Yeah, it was today's years old when I found out that a neep is actually a Swede. So turnips and Swedes were carved, as well as potatoes. I'm going to post some p- some pictures of carved turnips because they're so creepy. <laughs> they are they are like little shrunken heads. Um, I they're love fantastic. Them. But I yeah, I had no idea potatoes were apparently also carved, and I feel like it would be quite tricky to hollow out a potato. <laughs> I mean, it keep the kids busy. I guess. Um, I mean, I was chatting to my dad about this earlier. I was like, yeah, we're doing an episode on, you know, carving things tonight. And apparently people carve potatoes. And he was just like, oh, yeah, I used to do that when I was a kid. <laughs> <laughs> like, what? <laughs> so can you please tell us, <laughs> if you're listening, whether or not you've heard of potato carving as a Halloween tradition? <laughs> Because I would like to know. <laughs> so, also, just send us pictures of your jack-o'-lanterns or whatever. I want to see them. <laughs> yes, please. Can we start a gallery? <laughs> <laughs> so, carving root vegetable <laughs> is a tradition that probably is like 
super ancient. Um, apparently, the name Jack O' Lantern comes from an Irish folk tale, which is the tale of Stingy Jack. Apparently, beautiful. He carries around a turnip lantern. He's a ghost who carries around a turnip lantern. Um, but the tradition of carving like various root vegetables into faces and putting a light inside them is probably a very, very old one. And it is originally a Celtic tradition, so from Ireland and Scotland, where people would carve Swedes or turnips or apparent potatoes. Um, and apparently it was, there's not a lot of information on this, uh, but it's thought to be originally um, a way of warding off kind of spirit and um, sort of less less beneficial spirits that were around at this time of the year. And so apparently people would also do things like in the north of England, they would put Rowan on the door to keep away, you know, the witches and the, the bad guys. And then people would also put these carved vegetables outside with scary faces on. Can and I then, just say, mm -hmm. so you kind of lumped the potatoes in with the turnips, but we didn't really get potatoes until a similar time that we learned about pumpkins. So someone yeah. looked at the variety <laughs> of New World vegetables and said, "That turnip, that that potato looks easy to hollow out." <laughs> that is. That is a good one. Um, I think probably, I don't think carving pumpkins really caught on in Britain until it was like a kind of, we got it back as a tradition from America. I think it's more of a, the potato was the one that was adopted as food first. So people just had those best. more. Yeah. Mm. Um, so potatoes were around, but pumpkins apparently don't grow as well here um which i don't know maybe that's true because we've got a pumpkin in the garden and it's pretty small <laughs> <laughs> um but i think we didn't have the you know the big carving varieties of pumpkin mm. until fairly recently yeah, so there maybe is that's why isn't there like the carving variety ones taste not of much yeah they're not they're not great eating <laughs> um in fact, uh, there are so many varieties of pumpkin, and if you haven't, you should absolutely go and try them because some of them are amazing and they're all sorts of shapes and sizes. When I was a kid, we had a family tradition of going to this farm where it was in a little village called Slindon in West Sussex, and the owner was a friend of my granddad's, and they had a fantastic idea for marketing their pumpkins and squashes every year, which was that on the roof of their barn, they made this massive picture out of pumpkins and squashes. <laughs> That's awesome. And then they would just set up all of their wares, all of their vegetables, and then people would come to see the picture and like buy pumpkins <laughs> and stuff. <laughs> and they sold postcards and things. It was fantastic. I'm going to see if I can dig up one of these postcards and put it on Twitter because you need to see this. <laughs> like one year they did a massive, it was like a witch flying past a moon and loads of different stuff it was amazing that sounds amazing it's taking decorative gourds to an extreme <laughs> that road that road gets dangerous kids don't mess around <laughs> with decorative gourds not even once <laughs> so yeah there's there's so many varieties that taste better than the the massive carving pumpkins and you can't really do anything with them anyway because once you've scooped out the insides i mean you can you can dry and roast the seeds i guess but once you've burnt a candle in it the flesh isn't and had it on your porch for a couple of days it's not really going to be great to eat anyway no like i guess you could eat the bits you've cut out but again that's it's not a very nice pumpkin no what you I mean, want is one of those little green ones Mm, or one of yeah, the kind of flying so saucer sweet. ones. I haven't had those ones. 
Got to go on a pumpkin mission. It's off the top and microwave it for a bit and then put some butter in, right? Oh. Yeah. Making me hungry. I've just eaten and now I'm hungry. I <laughs> know, right? Okay, so the, the many varieties. What was I talking about before we got onto the myriad varieties of pumpkin? Carving potatoes. Um, oh, yeah. So uh, it being a Celtic tradition um, in Ireland and Scotland, especially. And that tradition carried on throughout it becoming a Christian festival. And over the years, it kind of, you know, lost the kind of human fear of the unknown aspect of it and became just like a fun thing to do. And uh, the tradition of trick-or-treating actually also started in, um, in Britain, apparently. But in Scotland, it was called guising. So oh, like people you're wearing would go around. Um, it's kind of like a lot of holidays. I, yeah, I guess, kind of like disguise. So I think it's like a lot of holidays in that, you know, the kids would go around um, dressed up and knocking at doors and asking for stuff. <laughs> um, you know, like Guy Fawkes Night when people would make a guy and ask for a penny for the guy or something. Um, so I don't think they were saying trick or treat at the time, but that's how the tradition began of going round the neighbourhood in costumes with your turnip lantern, of course. And so in the 19th century, when there was massive immigration from Scotland and Ireland into America, um, that is that is where pumpkins first started to be carved because people got to America and obviously took their traditions with them and then found pumpkins, which are kind of perfect for carving scary faces on and putting lights in. I mean, they're a lot bigger than turnips. And so they, yeah, they just became the vegetable of choice <laughs> for making into a jack-o'-lantern and it's got to the point where that tradition has now kind of come back again and that's that's the popular vegetable over here too um and i have to admit i mean i've actually never carved a turnip and i think i'm gonna give it a go this year because it sounds fun um but i'll probably still do a pumpkin as well because i don't know there's just more more canvas you know mm. <laughs> more creative space also i appreciate how many times you said the phrase popular vegetable in the past <laughs> 10 minutes <laughs> what can i say everybody loves the pumpkin <laughs> <laughs> i'm probably not going to carve the potato So, yeah, that's the origins of pumpkin carving and the history thereof. But Halloween isn't just about pumpkin carving. There's actually a lot of other kind of folk traditions that perhaps have been forgotten that, that kind of tie in to the older origins of it. Because kind of all over the Celtic world, um, like Samhain wasn't this pan-Celtic festival, really. Um, but there were, like, it, it seems that kind of each region had a slightly different one, but they all seem to have, have involved some element of prophecy and kind of predicting the future. Ooh. And it's interesting that a lot of the Halloween traditions that survive, I mean, in this book, there's quite a lot of them. And this was published in 1982. So I'm going to assume that people were still doing these in at least the 1980s. Um, a lot of these Halloween traditions involve things like predicting the future in some way, mostly in the form of predicting who you're going to marry. <laughs> um, yes. Because... There's, so there's an Agatha Christie book called Halloween Party, where like the inciting event is 
all the girls of the town doing this weird like scrying ritual to figure out who they're gonna marry (laughs) i have never heard of that book that's fantastic i want to read it it's one of my favorite christies (laughs) that's like the perfect combination of things (laughs) um yeah so there's apple bobbing which is probably the most well-known game um and that that's really fun if only because everyone looks absolutely ridiculous doing it yeah <laughs> so if you've not apple bobbed before that's when you get a, a big bowl of water and you put apples in it and then everyone has their hands tied behind their backs and the first person to be able to pick up an apple with their teeth is the winner always good fun It also says here that if you stick two apple seeds on your cheeks and give the name of a suitor to each one, the one that sticks the longest loves you the most. I love that so much. (laughs) Which I kind of want to get everybody around a table doing that because that would be hilarious. Next year, we've got to have a proper Halloween party. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Because, like, Halloween is, like, three days before my birthday. I like doing big birthday Halloween things. Awesome. Next year. Yeah, for sure. Halloween times. (laughs) Um, There's also a lot of foods involved, mostly pumpkin-related. I have never had a pumpkin pie. Because I am slightly nervous at the... I always used to think it was a savoury pie. And I was okay with that. And then I found out that pumpkin pie is actually a dessert. And that kind of freaked me out a bit. It is really nice, though. Because it's like... You know, like a butternut squash where it's just really, really sweet? Okay. That's what it tastes like. Like butternut squash and pudding spice. I'll have to give that a go then, because I've, I've mm, I'll try it. <laughs> I'll try it. I can't promise anymore. <laughs> so a lot of things involved with predicting the future, um, also using apples or nuts, because those are things that are around in the autumn in the Northern mm-hmm. Hemisphere. And then... The kind of less appreciated uh, sister of Halloween or All Hallows Eve is All Souls Day or All Saints Day. Um, Traditionally, in the Christian calendar, the day of appreciating the saints. But also a lot of kind of folkloric things and traditions that went along with it that were sometimes kind of related to Halloween as well. So apparently um, it was traditional on the eve of All Souls or Halloween to keep kitchens warm and leave food on the table overnight for any visiting spirits. Um, well, that's just and polite. soul cakes were distributed on All Souls Day. Wait, soul cakes like the soul cake duck in this world? As far as I can, like the soul cake duck. (laughs) (laughs) So soul cakes um, are kind of little cookies with made of like flour, butter, sugar, and spices. So they're sort of little, little bun kind of cookie bun things, (laughs) and. They they were apparently um, distributed to visitors um, and especially distributed to the poor on All Souls Day, which apparently is the origin of the custom of going souling at the end of October or the first day of November. So that could be another origin of the trick and treat tradition. Interesting. Yeah. I'm honestly surprised that we haven't had what just one really out there explanation because we always have one when no one knows where something comes from. There's always one where it's like, well, this specific guy in the 1400s. Sorry, I didn't catch all of that. Oh, it was the same. 
because it's weird for this podcast, I think, to have a tradition that no one knows where it comes from. And there isn't just one story of like, well, this guy in the 1400s <laughs> called Mr. Trick O'Treat. <laughs> and his brother, Mr. Jack O'Lantern. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean... <laughs> so, I mean, I guess it started with stuff like cake or maybe small change and things. Um mm. And then it's kind of easy to see it evolving into, you know, sweets and chocolate and things. That kind of makes sense. Um, so, yeah, apparently it was it was like acceptable to ask for soul cakes at this time. So I guess that's where that comes from. Um, also. So when my parents wouldn't let me go trick or treating because it was just begging, they weren't entirely wrong. I mean, no. Well, like. It kind of is, yeah, but like, <laughs> that's not bad. <laughs> I mean, it's kids. Come on. Yeah, yeah that, was, that was my argument. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's supposed to be but fun. You're supposed to do it. <laughs> like, this is the, the one day when it's okay. <laughs> it's, it's, it's sweets from strangers day. <laughs> and everyone agrees that that's fine because... It's fun. It's, it's fine because there's ghosts. <laughs> Official ghost begging day. <laughs> Petition um, to rename Halloween to ghost begging day. <laughs> <laughs> so I think you'll be particularly interested in my last fact my last halloween related fact which is that lancashire parking oh yes <laughs> which is um if you've not had a parking before it's Gym a kind of cake mm, yeah like a really dense it is the stickiest thing you can get the crumbs after you've eaten a slice of it and squeeze them together into a new small cake. <laughs> it's that sticky. Like the Play-Doh of cake. Yes, but in a good way. <laughs> Excellent. I am making that um, November's Patreon recipe. Oh, yes. I'm going to try and make some this year. Because so, Lancashire Parkin was apparently once called Parkake, which... It says here is originally named for the Norse good Odin, the Norse god Odin or Ha, and eaten on All Souls Day. See, that one sounds fake. Now, I have not been able to verify this. However, it's kind of a cool idea. <laughs> I mean, I was always told that parking should be eaten on bonfire night. Yeah, it does say it's now associated with bonfire night. Um, Alongside treacle I mean, toffee. To be honest, they're kind of close together, and yeah, I, I'm, I wouldn't be surprised if the tradition of having bonfires at that time of year was already a thing. Yeah, probably. It's just it's the bonfire and treacle zone. Yeah, it's the, the calories. <laughs> it's the lights and fires and telling the scary things to go away time. And yeah, Lancashire Parkin is definitely a an autumn winter food. I'm really craving it now. <laughs> my my great grandma's parkin recipe, it's so sticky. Mmm sticky grandma. Why? <laughs> of Halloween and All Saints Day traditions. Hi, it's Liz here. Um, the internet rebelled, so I'm just going to be recording the local louder on my own today. Um, so because we were doing kind of a Halloween-y thing, I thought I'd look at candy corn, which I'm pretty sure is one of the most controversial foods at this point. So, originally, 
It was called um, Chicken Feed, just because it looks like individual corn kernels, and was actually invented in 1898, which I did not think it was that old. And this was a point where corn wasn't really a staple in most Americans' diets. But, you know, yeah. Where corn wasn't really a staple in most Americans' diets. But the idea of little fondant sweets that looked like food was a big thing in sort of agricultural areas. So you could also get uh, sort of little pumpkins and other different plants made of this same substance, which was called buttercream. Even though it's not buttercream, <laughs> it's always been kind of a marshmallowy fondanty mush. Which, that sounds bad, but I, I quite like candy corn personally. I don't know if Hazel does. I don't know if Hazel's had it. We don't really get it here that much, apart from like the shops that specifically sell American sweets, which I tend to avoid because I don't like most American sweets, especially the chocolate. I don't know what you guys did to chocolate, but stop it. So the process for making them now is pretty much the same as it was then. It's just more mechanized. Um, but also, in, I find it interesting that it didn't really become a thing outside of agricultural areas until the post-war period. But that kind of makes sense because that's also the time where we're getting a lot more corn syrup in American food because it's sort of homegrown and it's not going to be affected if there's another world war because they'd already had two well because we'd already had two and it didn't exactly look like that was going to be it for a while so you, you get adverts for it calling it things like butter sweet candy corn which again i don't i don't think anyone now would describe candy corn as buttery i've i've, <laughs> I've heard people compare it to candle wax which I don't think is what they're going for. But you know what has the exact same texture, though, is when I had braces, I got given this, like, wax stuff that I could put on them to make them rub less, and that was the exact same texture as candy corn. If you just rolled that around in sugar, it would have been indistinguishable, I swear. So in sort of the 50s, 60s is when it starts to become associated with autumn specifically because that's the point where trick-or-treating really takes off so they used to sell it individually wrapped and promote it as you know give this to the trick-or-treaters it's small and cheap and full of sugar and there is actually a national candy corn day the day before halloween but you can get it in colours other than the classic red, yellow and white, which has been the colour since the beginning. There's Valentine's varieties and also a Christmas one that's red and green and I think the idea is it's supposed to look like a little Christmas tree. But it's the same shape as regular candy corn, so I'm not sure how much it looks like that and more like a failed attempt at a watermelon slice. So that's my brief history of candy corn. If you have enjoyed the podcasts and maybe want to suggest an episode or a local larder, we're always looking for ideas. You can email breadandthreadpodcast at gmail.com or tweet at breadandthread on Twitter. And if you want to support us, we do have a Patreon. It's just Bread and Thread. We can get access to monthly Patreon-exclusive recipes and a patron discord server and if you subscribe at the ten dollar a month level we will make a personal bonus episode on whatever topic you want so do go ahead and do that i'm excited to see what our listeners interests are so thank you for listening and we'll talk to you again soon